Good to be with you again. I suppose it's natural as we come to some significant highlights and moments in our lives, we kind of look back over our lives and remember lots of little things that have brought us to where we are today. <laughs> so I kind of like to share with you this morning some uh, memories I have of my, my life. I was born in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, 1936. Uh, Bay Ridge is that part of Brooklyn that is right near the Narrows, uh, the main entrance into New York Harbor. Uh, Mom probably should have had me baptized there in St. Patrick's Church, but she took me back to the home parish, a Lady of Perpetual Help, which is served by the Redemptorist priest. And they soon enough moved back there to my grandmother's three-story brownstone home, which was right across the street from the church. Uh, Our Lady of Perpetual Help, I suppose, is the largest church in Brooklyn. It was often used by the diocese when a new bishop was consecrated or the funerals and such, ordinations. Uh, One of the biggest churches And our home was right across the street on the south side of the church. I was uh, born, I'm told, by mom on Ash Wednesday. So her sister, my Aunt Rose, went to the church with an envelope and got some ashes to bring to us. So I received ashes on the day I was born, (laughs) being reminded that I would die someday. Uh, The priest who uh, baptized me, and I suppose there were 10, 20 kids every week being baptized at that large parish, uh, he happened to be named Stanley Lewandowski. And uh, I was the first one to be baptized by him with his own name. Years later, after I was a day mom arranged for me to meet him, he was retired on the uh, Jersey Shore at that point. My earliest memory of any kind is sitting in my grandmother's lap uh, in her rocker, looking out the street uh, through the bay window on the second floor, and watching a procession of men in black and white going up toward Fifth Avenue and up to the high steps that would lead to the upper church. And at the end of the procession, some men came in gold. I realized later these are first mass celebrations. They had so many vocations for the priesthood uh, in that parish that they would have two or three first masses every Sunday for two or three weeks every June. Of course, I received my first communion, first confession there in the Lady of Perpetual Help and began my schooling. Of course, I lived through the Second World War. I can still remember on Pearl Harbor going with mom to a delicatessen. I guess they were allowed to open for a few hours on a Sunday. Most stores were all closed. And hearing the adults speaking in subdued terms about what had happened, one lady saying, did you hear what happened? The Japanese have bombed our base at Pearl Harbor. And another lady saying, well, where's Pearl Harbor? And she said, well, it's in Hawaii. Well, where's Hawaii? It was a time that was very difficult for many people. I remember it particularly being a very dark time because there was such fear of the enemy submarines that were on the east coast of the U.S. that everyone was ordered to keep uh, any light sources hidden and so we had to have special shades on the windows to make sure no light went out to the street and there were even wardens appointed in every street to make sure we complied so that the enemy could not see ah there's New York we're all lit up I remember on the subway seeing so often the signs telling us to keep our mouths shut, don't talk, spies are listening everywhere. And of course, when mom sent me to the store, she not only would give me the money for whatever it was, the flour, the sugar, but also 
the rationing stamp that allowed one pound of flour or one pound of sugar. Dad had the car with the license uh, thing allowing us to have so many gallons of gas each week. At one point, uh, they had given me a, a wooden box with uh, tools to play with as a child. And I must have tripped on a rug and hit it so that I was hit right on the center of the nose here. And mom brushed me over the doctor who put in three stitches so I had a perfect V on my nose here for years, which became the symbol, of course, of victory. And I was a local celebrity in the parish, a uh, sign, a living sign of victory for us in this war. At one point, we had to move from our home in Brooklyn, 1943. Uh, the, uh, my grandmother had given the home to her youngest son, uh, confident that he would never get married. Uh, he had hurt himself as a child tumbling and so didn't grow to full stature and and she always felt very sorry for him so in 1943 he decided to marry so he told my mother and dad that we had to get out of our apartment there on the basement floor and it was a difficult time as you can imagine my mother really got her Irish up <laughs> was very upset after all she had done for him cleaning and ironing his white shirts and feeding him at times. But later came to realize what a blessing that was because they were able to buy a home in suburban Flushing, uh, Queens County, for $7,500. <laughs> and she said, we would never have been able to buy a home later on after the war when all home prices skyrocketed. So what seemed to be such an awful thing in the beginning turned out to be quite a blessing. Of course, 1943 was a, a difficult year. Uh, when mom took me to the local school then, we were only one block away from St. Kevin's School and Church. And uh, the sister principal didn't want to accept me at first because they were so crowded but I had very good grades, and so she took me in. Now, there were 36 of us in a class that would be graduating in Februarys, and then there were another 58 in a regular June class. I, I can't imagine how Sister Victor and the others did it. Teaching one class at one point while we did a written assignment, then switching, and they did a written assignment while she taught us. Constantly teaching. There were so many desks in the room uh, on the side uh, aisle near the uh, blackboard and up front there were so many chairs and uh, desks. When the sister came from the mother house uh, to teach us music, she could only enter the room. She couldn't even walk in front of the blackboard. There was no room. But in spite of all that, we somehow learned I graduated there in 1950 and went to high school. I earned a, scholar, a scholarship sort of to Bishop Lachlan High School, a diocesan school. Each parish was allowed to send two boys. Uh, two girls went to Bishop McDonald, the high school for the girls. Uh, that meant that I would now every morning take an hour, an hour and a quarter ride in the subway system of New York. First a 15 minute ride down into um, uh, Flushing where the subway ended, then take the train to Jackson Heights, about eight stops, then go down 99 steps into the independent line subway and take it into Brooklyn. It was a difficult time to try to study Latin and algebra or whatever on the bus and the subway. I know that in later years, uh, they put in an escalator to help older people, especially climb those 99 steps. The high school was conducted by the Christian brothers. 
it was actually the site of where Brooklyn's cathedral should have been built. At one point, Bishop Blockland, the first bishop of Brooklyn, had uh, begun the building and the walls were up 14 feet before they ran out of money. And a later bishop said, we need a high school for boys more than a cathedral. So they knocked that down and built our high school there. And the bishop's house, which had been already built on the corner, uh, became the house for the Christian brothers. Across the street was the chancery building. And of course they had a problem then because they had been counting on the cathedral to be the parish for that area. So across the street there was a large Masonic temple on the left side of the street, but on the right side a pastor built a building and closed the parochial school, the church, rectory and convent all in one building with all the Gothic trappings, Queen of All Saints. Monsignor George Mundelein, who was later made the Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago. Many a time I would drop in there for pray before going to classes. In the school I joined the yearbook organization and also became one of the volunteers in the library, helping Brother William to put books back on the shelves and so on. Now that gave me an opportunity to uh, talk to him a lot about uh, things and my vocation. Uh, in St. Kevin's Parish, I had been become an altar server. There were four priests there, the elderly pastor, Monsignor DeLay, who was a native from Ireland. Apparently he got his name from one of the Spanish uh, who were shipwrecked on the uh, coast of Ireland during the Armada back in the 1500s. And then there was a senior assistant. Uh, the next assistant, Father Joe Keyes, was really my model for a priest. Always happy, uh, uh, delighted to be a priest, a good preacher. And then the fourth priest, the uh, younger assistant who was given the charge of the altar service, uh, and later became a secretary to the Bishop of Brooklyn. The senior assistant though, was a rather difficult man. He was generally very negative, seemed always angry, impatient, on the rush. Uh, the first time I served Mass, I remember two of us new guys were with the two experienced servers. And in those days, we had to say all the prayers at the foot of the altar in Latin, especially the confitier. And I remember him demanding that I say it over, say it over, say it over four times. But apparently I got on to how he wanted things so much that I became one of the three or four altar servers who were always assigned to his masses. I said enough Latin to satisfy him, but not slow him down in his 19-minute daily mass. So I talked with Brother William, I guess, about priesthood, but I had so many negative stories and experiences with that priest that I was inclined to dismiss the thought of a being a diocesan priest. But Brother William helped me to realize, yes, in every phase of life, there'll be people who live up to the ideals of their profession or their station, and others who don't. And so I began to think again of priesthood. I graduated in 1954, in February. That morning I entered St. John's College of, uh, of the university. And so I was taking the same bus and train trip each morning, but getting off the train two stops earlier, and then walking four long blocks through the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, which had a synagogue or a rabbinical school on each block. When I went to a priest about my thoughts of becoming a priest, and he said, well, you have to go to the chancery in order to get the um, exemption with the 
social, uh, the uh, security uh, draft status and such. So I went to the Chancery and uh, the secretary gave me a form to fill out an application for the seminary of the Diocese of Brooklyn at Huntington. And I said, oh no, I, I just entered St. John's that morning and now that's what you need. Uh, Monsignor will see you when you're finished. So I filled it out thinking mom and dad are going to be surprised tonight when I tell them I just filled out an application for the seminary. <laughs> So I saw Monsignor and he said, well, you have a scholarship to St. John, so uh, I can understand you wanting to go there, but don't take any philosophy there. You certainly want to have better philosophy background than they give to basketball players. At that time, St. John's probably had about 7,000 students and how many were on the basketball team? So I kind of forgot about that and years went on. I joined the yearbook of the uh, university. And at the end of the second year, I received in the mail a letter from the chancery uh, calling for me to uh, uh, fill out the application again for the seminary of Brooklyn and have all these medical tests and x-rays and everything. And when I called and said, I'd like to speak to Monsignor first, uh, no, you must fill everything out and then he will see you. So again, I met with that Monsignor and he said, well, you have this scholarship. Maybe you could ask St. John's to give you the scholarship to go to the seminary. Well, I couldn't even ask that with a straight face <laughs> to give me a seminary. Uh, uh, an applic um, a scholarship to go somewhere else. <laughs> so I thought, I've got to make up my mind here and, and do something. Um, my folks, I guess, couldn't understand why I wouldn't want to stay in the Brooklyn area. But during uh, St. John's first two years there in Brooklyn, I had a lot of time on my hands between courses and I spent a lot of time in the library reading and I came on publications that talked about this liturgical revival in the church. And I always had thought that if the Pope said you should do something, everybody hopped up and did it. And here for years, uh, Popes had been saying since St. Pius X in the first years of the 1900s, that there should be this liturgical revival, that we should get people actively participating in the celebration of Mass, and none of it was happening. I also had become very interested in the home missions in the U.S. I thought, oh, well, Brooklyn, these cities, the big cities in the East with all the big Catholic population, they didn't need more priests. And mom used to get Extension Magazine, which is uh, an effort to reach out and help the areas of the country where there aren't that many Catholics. And on a couple of vacations, we experienced what it was like in those areas, in the West and in the South, where there were not many Catholics. And so I thought I would want to become a priest somewhere in a diocese which really needed priests and possibly be able to do more in terms of the liturgical renewal. I remember in uh, one year, the, Pope Pius XII reformed the Holy Week liturgy. And some efforts were made in the parish, but it was almost a grudging effort and I remember getting so disgusted at one point that I walked the three miles to another parish because I knew they would take the liturgy there seriously and celebrate it respectfully. And so I wrote to the editor of Worship Magazine, Father Godfrey Diekman, a Benedictine at St. John's in Collegeville, Minnesota, which was the center of the American effort to promote the liturgical revival. And he suggested that I apply to the Diocese of Superior, Wisconsin. Uh, it was a missionary area north of uh, Wisconsin. And 
the bishop very attuned to the liturgical revival. So I was accepted by the diocese and assigned to attend the seminary in uh, Collegeville, which was at the uh, St. John's Abbey. Uh, St. John's Abbey was actually the largest Benedictine monastery in the world at the time, 300 monks, many of them, of course, on missions in the Bahamas and Mexico and Tokyo and such. And the seminary itself was administered by three priests of the uh, Diocese of St. Cloud there. Uh, that area, that whole county was like 90% Catholic. And aside from Stearns County, all the other counties were 90% Lutheran. Uh, I remember taking the uh, train out to the seminary First night, I guess I was away from my own family. I was an only child, and uh, I had heard that would be very difficult for me when I slept right through it. <laughs> I got to St. Cloud, and I remember getting off the train and seeing the train go down west across the flat plains and thinking, I don't know a single person within a thousand miles of here. <laughs> what am I doing? I was one of only 10 seminarians from the East or out of 100 seminarians. Of course, our teachers were Benedictines and I had there, I think, a couple of the best teachers I've ever had in my life. Now, this was 1957. In 56, you may recall, the Hungarian people had revolted against their communist oppressors and for a week or two there was freedom and one of the Benedictine monks who got out of Hungary at that point became the main teacher of dogmatic theology for us, Father Achilles Horvath. And he was such a delight, a great teacher. He gave us an overview of theology all through the centuries, the patristic area, the medieval and, and the modern developments that many others wouldn't even talk about. I always remember he would have all his books that he was going to cite lined up, perfect order, as he needed them. And when he took up the Bible, he didn't have to say, I'm reading from the Bible. Just the way he held that book and turned pages said so much about this is the living word of God. And I was also privileged to have Father Godfrey Diekman as our teacher in patristics. It was that year that the monks there voted to build their new, very modern abbey church. And uh, it was quite a development there. I sensed though when I came back at Christmas time, I realized my folks were beginning to think about moving to the Midwest. And it never dawned on me that my decision about priesthood would impact their lively. They were New Yorkers, and their families and friends were all there, and I didn't want to have them uprooted from that. So I began to think about my life again. And that year, in December, February or so, you may recall recently there was talk about the great flu epidemic. Uh, I know there were no closings, or closing of schools or anything in those days, but uh, at one point, one-third of the seminarians were sick, confined in the, their rooms, another third taking the food trays up to them. I was one of the last ones to go down, and at that point, everyone was so sick of sickness that there were some days when no one remembered to bring me a food tray. <laughs> I had a lot of time to lay there and think about things and realize I think the Lord is calling me in a different direction. At St. John's in New York, I had particularly two close friends, Phil Seary, who lived in Jamaica, and was related to a priest in the Diocese of Wilmington, Father Bill Cooming. And so he had become a seminarian for Wilmington. And the other friend, John O'Brien, who was from the Bronx, also went with Wilmington. And I thought, well, Wilmington is close enough to New York, but not too close. 
I guess especially as an only child, I sense I'm going to need some distance in my life to get established. So I received permission to take a train up to Superior, Wisconsin and meet the bishop and ask him to release him so that I could transfer to another diocese closer to home. And so I, I never have regretted that year at Collegeville. As I said, I felt I had some of the greatest teachers I've ever experienced. But Monsignor Taggart, the vacation director, decided that I should go to uh, Washington to the Theological College of Catholic University, where there were two other Wilmington seminarians. Uh, this seminary was conducted by the Sulpician Fathers, who also uh, manned the major uh, seminary in Baltimore. Uh, when I arrived, I remember uh, meeting the rector, and the first thing he said to me as he puffed on his um, uh, uh, pipe was, Stanley Russell, how did you get a name like that? So I had to explain to him that, well, yeah, mom's ancestors came from Ireland, Cork and Kerry counties, at the time of the potato famine. And so they, they never knew privilege. <laughs> uh, there were lots of signs in stores saying, no Irish need apply, no Irish will be hired. And dad's family, his father was from Poznan in Poland and his mother from Essen in the Ruhr Valley of Germany. They came over around the 1900. And he very quickly realized he was a roofer by trade and he realized if he was going to get enough work to uh, uh, take care of his family, he needed to change his name from Rorschach to Russell that would be more acceptable in American society. He felt that kind of pressure, that discrimination against those people from Eastern Europe. I always have to laugh when I hear people talk about the privilege of white people. I think many of our ancestors never felt they were very privileged. They had to work hard for it. And so, I was accepted into Theological College, Second Theology. Uh, that seminary was being built in the 1920s, and when they ran out of money, and of course the Depression hit, they were never able to complete it. So the room I was assigned to was a room at the end of the second floor hall, and so one wall of it was really an interior wall, no insulation. The north side, our windows faced the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, which was still in the process of being built at that point. They were still building the tower. And when the winds blew, man, it was cold. My, uh, the seminary was so crowded, they assigned two of us to a room intended for one person. They were supposed to be bunk beds, but most of us chose to have the beds both down on the floor. So it was rather crowded, as you can imagine, with a couple of desks and a couple of uh, drawers uh, with clothing and such. And of course, just the sink for wash and the lavatories, uh, the showers, everything were down the hallway, a common area. And so we put up plastic over the windows to try to keep out some of that cold. I guess I was a bit used to the cold because when my family had moved to Flushing in New York in 1943, it was a very cold winter. And as we sat there, we would watch the wind blow and the curtains and drapes in the room blew with the wind. In those days, they used to pump the asbestos into the walls of the house and over the years that, that had all settled down and of course we couldn't get any more asbestos because the war was going on and you couldn't get more fuel oil that was a fixed amount each month for each home 
And the lady who had lived there before, her husband was in the military, she worked somewhere as many women were drafted into filling positions that the men had held. So it was a pretty cold winter. I remember as a kid, mom often taking me at three o'clock down to the bus and going into Flushing to go to a movie theater just to get warm. Needless to say, my grades really dropped that year. And dad at times was very handy, so he could disconnect the oil burner if he got some wood or was able to buy some coal somewhere and get a good fire going and get some really hot water. And then we would have to take our baths in the uh, the uh, cellar bathtub. I'd be in first, and then mom would get in, then dad. It was a cold winter, so I guess that prepared me for a cold seminary room. <laughs> At one point when I was sick, the infirmarian came around and to check him and said, no wonder you're sick, this room is so cold. My roommate, Celi Bejani, had been in Lebanon first year of seminary, but a war had broken out there, so he decided to come back to the States. He was a member of the Maronite rite, and so he would be praying his prayers in Arabic while we were saying the prayers in Latin or English. The uh, year, of course, for our ordination as uh, deacons was in the senior year, and at that point, uh, we were ordained in the uh, National Shrine. And then the following year, May 61, we were to be ordained priest. On the day that our class had our final get-together social gathering, we were able to go out to some park and have a day spent there where we would be together because we would then be scattering to dioceses all over the country. 27 of us in our class. And when we came back, the rector called Jim Delaney, my classmate, uh, and me, and said, uh, your new bishop in Wilmington, Bishop Michael Heil, has had a heart attack. So we don't know about your ordination. Well, Jim kept calling Monsignor Taggart every week to ask, do we know who's going to ordain us? And Monsignor Taggart kept saying, you will be ordained May 27th in St. Peter's Cathedral at 11 o'clock. We don't know who is the bishop. You can't put his name on the invitations. <laughs> Later on, we learned that they had gotten an auxiliary bishop in Philadelphia to agree to ordain us, and he died. They got an auxiliary bishop in Baltimore to agree to come and ordain the four of us. And he was involved in an auto accident. They got an auxiliary in Washington to agree to do it. And he became gravely ill. So the word must have been spread through the American hierarchy. If you get a call from Wilmington to ordain four deacons to the priesthood, don't say yes, something awful will happen. It happened that Bishop Schlotterbach, an oblate of St. Francis de Sales, a bishop in Southwest Africa, uh, was in the States for vacation and fundraising for the missions. So he never got the warning. <laughs> so he was the bishop who ordained us to the priesthood. And when Jim Delaney and I came from the seminary to Wilmington and reported to Monsignor Taggart, he said, oh good, you're here. My, uh, Father Julian's moving his office and we need you to move these books and these bookcases. And in the process, I guess I damaged my back. And nobody had made any plans about a dinner, supper, in the seminary, it was always just there. So, uh, uh, Jim Delaney uh, invited me to come with him to his family up in Westchester and of course they weren't expecting us so I don't know what we had maybe some soup and some tuna fish something I know that my stomach was growling for food as I went to the rehearsal 
And Father Jim Hamill, who was uh, driving us there to the rehearsal, said, don't worry, as soon as the rehearsal is over, we will go immediately to the refrigerator. Uh, two of us were assigned to uh, Christ our King Victory. I was assigned with another assembly uh, to St. Mary's on the east side. And so we went to the refrigerator and I can still remember seeing that one large watermelon and some cans of 7-Up. That was it. So I went to bed that night very hungry. My back killing me, thinking maybe when I get down on the floor in the ordination, I may not be able to get up again. And that night, Friday, many of the folks were uh, paid this salaries. So there was a little tavern down the street. And so they serenaded me at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. I thought, ah. Oh. I may fall asleep when I'm on that floor of the cathedral. So I got up, excited. I'm being ordained a priest this morning. And Father Clarahan saw me, and he said, oh, come with me to the convent. I'm celebrating a mass for the Franciscan nuns, and this will be the last mass you serve as a server before you're ordained. Uh, it happened to be an ember Saturday that we were being ordained after Pentecost. And that meant there were four readings in Latin, followed by a response and a prayer. And as I knelt there, I thought, oh, my back. So I finally got to the cathedral, and we were ordained. And afterwards, in the sacristy, I was t removing the vestments, and Monsignor Taggart came in and saw me and looked at the vesting table, and there were four white envelopes there. He said, don't you want to know where you're being assigned? And I said, oh, yes. Well, there's one there for you. <laughs> and I can still remember as I opened the letter, he was looking over my shoulder to see and I thought, he's the director of vocations. He's the only person who really knows me. Gee, if he doesn't know where I'm being assigned, how do they make assignments? And I opened it and he read, ah, oh, St. Edmund's in Rehoboth Beach. Oh, good. You have a good first pastor, Father Mickey McDonough. And I remember in the seminary, the Sulpician priest always encouraged us to pray. Pray that you get a good first pastor. It will make such an influence on your whole priestly life. And I used to wonder, what could a pastor do that would affect your whole life? I learned after ordination, as I saw some of the priests and what they had to put up with. So, we went on to the hospital, Monsignor Taggart said, I'm taking the four of you over to give a blessing, a first priestly blessing to Bishop Heil, and also Bishop Fitzmaurice, who was in another floor of the hospital. He had had a leg amputated in Ireland and was now recuperating. Of course, Bishop Heil met us, dressed in his cassock, pectoral cross and all, and spoke to us a while. He surprised us at one point, asking us to abstain from alcohol for five years. And I was, we were surprised. Uh, we knew some of our classmates in different dioceses were asked to abstain from alcohol for three years, five years, ten years. So then we gave a blessing to Bishop Fitzmaurice. And even though Monsignor Taggart has said, that's all we'll do, Somehow the word had spread all through St. Francis and every doctor, nurse, and patient was in the hallways waiting for us to give a blessing to each. So by the time we got back to St. Peter's Hall, almost everyone had left. There was very little food left. And then my parents and I drove uh, up to New York. The day before I had gotten my first car, 
a Ford Falcon stick shift. I thought that would be in accord with the ideals of modesty and simplicity that our professors told us would be important to maintain as a priest. A dad said he would drive my new car up to New York and then I drove his car with mom. And the next day we had the first mass at St. Kevin's Church. Uh, three of my friends from the seminary from other dioceses uh, came and served the mass. Uh, one of them had a home uh, on Long Island so the other two stayed with them there. And I had chosen for the preacher at my first Mass, Father Joe Keyes, who was my ideal priest. Uh, he uh, later became a pastor out at uh, Northport on the Long Island. And after uh, that first Mass and a little vacation time, I reported for my first assignment. And I was given a room at St. Patrick's rectory. And Monsignor Taggart said, oh good, you're in town. I'm supposed to preside at St. Patrick's School graduation tonight, and I have this conflict. Why don't you preside? I thought, what do I say? What do I do? How do you do this? <laughs> Monsignor Taggart was always finding jobs for us to do. I then drove to Rehoboth, and as I drove down on the old roads and came to Murderkill, Slaughter Beach, Broadkill, I thought, killing, killing, my goodness, and got to Rehoboth to St. Edmunds, and there Father McDonough, who was celebrating his 25th anniversary of ordination, and uh, had been in um, another parish on the eastern shore of Maryland, a Chestertown, and had been moved that year. So he wasn't too happy about having been moved. But they had decided to have uh, a little reception for him that afternoon at the Star of the Sea. That used to be a Franciscan nun's place at the shore and had been now made into a hotel. And when Harry Wright, the owner, went around with drinks for the little reception, and Father DeMichael, here's your Manhattan, and Father Fellows, here's your whiskey sour, and Father Russell, here's your lemonade, I thought, wow, they're going to enforce five years, five years of lemonade, wow. Uh, of course, that morning, I had celebrated Mass for St. Edmund's Parish, the air conditioning unit had broken down and nobody told the new pastor, Father McDonough. And at the first mass I had, I'll never forget it, because the crowd was so great, there were people filling all the pews, lined up all along the walls in the back, up the center aisle, and even in front of the front pews. So I had to try to project my voice over those people to reach the other five, six hundred people. I enjoyed that first assignment. I guess many priests were assigned to the beach parishes. The diocese thought that would be a good way for us to break in. There weren't all that many uh, retirees there in those days. And we would perhaps think that every parish had a nice beach in front of it. Unfortunately, about a month before ordination, I had an ear infection uh, with my left ear, which had uh, a perforated eardrum from the first grade. And so I was told by the doctors to stay away from the water for one year and then see if I could have it surgically closed. And I wondered, how did Bishop Heil know I could not go in the water at the beach? I remember as I tried to get to know some people, they said, well, there's no sense really getting to know you because you'll be out of here by the end of the year. My biggest challenge was to run the weekly Friday night bingo, which I came to know as the eighth sacrament of the Catholic Church. That winter, 
all the snow had come up to the canal and stopped. So it had snowed and melted and frozen. Kids were skating on Rehoboth Avenue. And I put on the radio the announcement that St. Edmund's bingo was canceled. There was no way to get into the hall except by outside steps, which were a sheet of ice. Well, those folks came in next week and said, don't you ever do that again. We had to drive to Ridgely, Maryland, 70 miles, because you canceled our bingo. I learned how dedicated they were to bingo. One night during the summer, the air conditioning had broken down in the hall. And at one point, there, at the end of the night, we were cleaning things up. and. There was some kind of insect going around because the windows had all been open. And it sounded like a dive bomb. And somebody said, oh, that's one of those such and such. And they, re they sound horrible, but they really don't hurt. And one came toward me and I instinctively ducked and was so sweated up that my glasses fell off and broke. Now at that time, the hall, the church, was one mile away from the rectory on the north side of Rehoboth. So that night I went back to the rectory with Father Shears, who came on the weekends to help us. And sure enough, that night the phone rang about 1 a.m. or so, and the voice said there was BB Hospital. We have a DOA. And as I tried to wake up, I guess I said DOA. And she said, yes, sir, that means dead on arrival. Yes, I understand. I'll be right there, I said. My first anointing. Well, I always thought someday people will need me and I will come like a knight in shining armor. But I didn't feel like a knight in shining armor. I was tired. <laughs> And as I started to dress, I realized I don't have a car. My holy oils are in the car. So I went in and tried to wake up Father Shears. Well, nothing I did, shouting, putting a light, nothing would wake him. So I went into the pastor's room and tried to wake him. Nothing would wake him. I saw his keys there and I thought, do I dare take the pastor's keys. He has a car with automatic everything. I have this simple stick shift Ford Falcon and I don't have glasses to see, but I gotta go. So I took the keys and drove to BB Hospital, all the time thinking, how do I do this? They never taught us that in the seminary. That, that, you learn that on your own. And all the time was spent on the doctrine and the laws and the history and all. And at that time in the Catholic Church, we could give one emergency anointing on the forehead, but the idea was to anoint all of the senses, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, the hands, the feet. And of course, as I was driving to uh, BB Hospital, all that area, which is now outlet stores, was just farmland. I got to the old hospital, and the nurse said, yes, Father, it's right in that room. And I thought, oh, this will be my first experience of a corpse. Hmm. As I pulled the sheep back, uh, it was a young man, prime of life, husky young man, he had been driving a foreign car on the wrong side of the road and hit a truck. So I began the anointings, the eyes, the ears, the nostrils. When I touched the hands, they moved. And I'm sure my hair must have stood on end. The corpse, the hands moved. And all I could think of was Alfred Hitchcock had a movie on TV once about a man who had nothing but contempt for one of the men he fired at work because he cried. And as he drove home that night, he was in an auto accident and everyone thought he was dead. And he couldn't communicate to them that 
I really am alive. And as the man began to approach him to do the procedure after death and embalm the body, one little tear formed in his eye and he realized, yes, the man is alive. And I thought, oh, but of course, this is why I'm doing this. The man is dead legally, but the church says we don't know when a person fully is dead. There may still be life in the body. So we give the benefit of a doubt and we can give the sacrament. We don't give sacraments to people who are totally dead. To complete the story, of course, as I went back to the rectory, I realized I had thrown my keys on the bed in disgust when I realized I don't have a car. And so I was now locked out of the rectory, but found how easy it was to jimmy the lock on the porch and get in, provided that the beach patrol didn't come by and arrest me for breaking into the rectory. At the end of uh, February, I went back to the seminary for the reunion, a few days in Washington, and uh, at the end of that, as I came back to uh, Rehoboth, Pope John Paul uh, John the Twenty Third had just signed the document, saying that we could not even discuss the possibility of having the vernacular in our celebration of the Mass. It had to remain in Latin, and all education in the seminary had to be in Latin. And that was a very discouraging thing for me because we had been doing what we call the Missa Recitata, trying to get people to respond to the prayers of the Mass in Latin, and it just wasn't working. When I got back to Rehoboth, Father McDonough said, while well, you're away, Bishop Heil called and asked if I could get along without you for three or four weeks. And I said, well, what did you say? And he said, Father, when the bishop asks you to do something, there is only one response. Yes, Bishop. So I packed my things and went up to St. Peter's Cathedral uh, the rector there had had to go away for a health cure, and so uh, I was needed there to help in St. Peter's Cathedral. That was Monday, and Ash Wednesday was that week, and that was the day the big storm of 62 hit, taking Rehoboth's Beach, Boardwalk, and everything with it. Uh, so I went back to Rehoboth and uh, found how much damage had been done and thought Rehoboth would never recover. I was still at the cathedral all through Lent and Easter, beginning to wonder because Father McDonough had always kidded about, as a young priest, he was given a temporary assignment to a parish that lasted 10 and a half years. And my three weeks had now turned to three months. And Father Hamel came in and said, you're going back to Rehoboth tomorrow. Father McDonough has collapsed of low blood pressure. You're to celebrate all the masses, uh, baptism of marriage, whatever, and call the bishop Monday to report on the situation. And so then I was changed permanently, three weeks later, uh, assigned to St. Anne's Parish in Wilmington. And so I think probably I bored you enough with these incidents of my early life and priesthood. Uh, I give thanks to God every time I think of the life he has given me and all the wonderful people, the priests, the lay people, the religious that I've had to work with over the years. I thank God that he has blessed me in so many ways. I hope he continues to bless each of you in every way. God love you.